So let's take a look at the general responses. In general, responding to adrenergic stimulation, what are some things that would happen here? Adrenergic stimulation, this can be either from epinephrine um, that, that is present in the bloodstream, or it can be due to norepinephrine. That's where our focus has been, uh, coming from the sympathetic nerves. And this is where things do start to admittedly get complex with, um, with adrenergic receptors. There are a lot of different subtypes, a lot of different subcategories. There are what we call alpha adrenergic receptors and there are beta adrenergic receptors. And then on top of that, there are different subtypes of each of those. There are two types of alpha adrenergic receptors and two types of beta adrenergic receptors. Um, what do they all have in common? They all uh, respond by using a G protein second messenger system, which we have seen before. That's where there's a G protein that splits apart, goes and activates something else in the cell membrane. Um, but anyway, the fact that there are so many different types means that there are a lot of different sort of signaling cascades that can be activated in the cell. So what is the end result going to be in the effector cell? It depends on which specific receptor has been activated. So in the end, um, binding of an adrenergic receptor, it can either lead to stimulation or inhibition. It just depends on the particulars of, of the cell that we are talking about. And in regards to pharmaceuticals, there are a number of pharmaceuticals that act on these adrenergic receptors. There are some that act as um, agonists, so they would be drugs that promote the same sort of stimulation that the neurotransmitter does, but then there are other drugs that are designed to be antagonists, and those would be drugs that block the action of the neurotransmitter. So a lot of these are very useful um, to, as targets in medical applications. Um, but again, the details, in each case, the details are going to depend on which particular receptor is being targeted for action. Receptors for acetylcholine, these are a little bit more straightforward, at least we're going to start out that way. So um, cholinergic receptors, again, cholinergic, this name is referring to the fact that the receptor can recognize acetylcholine. That's where this name comes from. So acetylcholine, when acetylcholine is released from the preganglionic neuron, that's always going to have an excitatory or stimulatory effect on the postganglionic neuron. Okay, so that's just a general rule. Um, when acetylcholine is released from the postganglionic neuron at the involuntary effector, what's going to happen then? Well, usually it's going to be stimulatory, the way that we're kind of used to thinking about acetylcholine. It's going to stimulate that target cell. There are some exceptions. There are some cases where it could instead be inhibitory, and that distinction is again going to come back to what type of receptor specifically was bound. So remember, with with, uh, with cholinergic receptors, there are a couple of different varieties. There are nicotinic receptors and there are muscarinic receptors. The nicotinic receptors, these act as ligand-gated ion channels. So when two molecules of acetylcholine bind to it, then the channel opens and allows ions to flow across the membrane. The muscarinic type, on the other hand, when acetylcholine binds, what this will cause is a G protein second messenger system to be activated. So different mechanisms in those two cases, which can, again, lead to different sorts of consequences, either stimulatory or inhibitory, just depends on which receptor type was present on the cell. Looking at some pictures to go along with these, in case you've forgotten from uh, the past chapter about neurotransmitters, neurotransmitter action, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, we've got a, a schematic of that on the left over here. Okay, so two molecules of acetylcholine bind, and then that opens up this ion channel. Sodium flows in one direction, potassium flows in the other direction, and this generally leads to depolarization and excitation of the cell. Over here on the right hand side, the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Um, here's binding of acetylcholine to its muscarinic receptor. Here's the G protein. This is the thing that when it's activated, it goes and causes something else to happen in the cell. It could be opening of another ion channel, 
Um, and depending on which ion channel is opened, this either leads to hyperpolarization or depolarization. So the, the end consequence, whether the, the cell is excited or inhibited, um, the end result will differ just depending on which ion channel was activated by the specific G protein. So over on the left, these are pretty predictable. Nicotinic receptors are predictable in the sense that they always lead to excitation. Muscarinic receptors, not quite as predictable, um, <laughs> just because it can do either of these two things depending on the particular cell that we're dealing with. 